go to the very beginning. <clears throat> the first three novels um, begin where? That is, when you open the page, what is the setting? Yeah, at the Dursley's house. I mean, you're on, you're on the way there, Joshua. Um, at the Dursley house, okay? Number four, Privet Drive, okay? Where does this one open up? Chapter one, the Riddle House. The villagers of Little, villagers of Little Angleton still called it the Riddle House even though it had been many years since the Riddle family had lived there. Why does she set this one to begin um, in a different place? What's the purpose of opening at the Riddle House and not number four, Privet Drive? Yes? Is it to, uh, like to change the tone like the rest of the series because it gets darker? Yeah, that's definitely part of it, okay? What else? I mean, that's very good. It does change the tone. In, in first three books um, are very different than the final four in terms of tone and darkness and atmosphere, okay? What else, though? Let's get more mm -hmm. background on Baltimore, and then also it's opening with Harry's dream, and I guess given more like Baltimore has more presence. So okay, so we're giving learning background on Voldemort. Um, takes us into Harry's mind a little bit. You were going to say? I was going to say it's is it like uh, putting focus more on depth in depth of a different side of things versus. Yep. Okay. I mean those are those are all fantastic. You're missing one thing that might not be obvious, and it would depend upon um, what you knew about not only the development of the stories, but how the stories were received. Okay. After the first three stories were published, there was talk that Rowling was writing very what's called formulaic fiction. That is... She was writing according to a formula, like she was following a list of ingredients. Okay? Formula fiction is very popular. You know, some of you might read some. Uh, even if you don't personally, I bet you know somebody who does. Okay? For example, you can walk into a bookstore and a real bookstore, not a bookstore that's primarily games and stuff like that. But you can walk into a bookstore and you'll see over the racks of books or on the walls labels, right? What are some of the labels you will see for kinds of fiction? Historic fiction. Okay, historic fiction. Historic fiction, however, isn't formulaic, okay? Because the history involved will determine how the fiction goes. In other words, you can't, you can't start with, with um, I can't remember what the name of the sheet's called. There's a sheet that publishers of formula fiction will give out to prospective writers. And it essentially says this novel should be 50 to 70,000 words long. It should have a a uh, love affair, preferably between a single man and a single woman, and there will be another man or woman involved, but it is never a threesome kind of a thing, okay? because they're kind of traditional morality in that sense. Um, it's, when you're dealing with historical characters, although you play around with them a little bit, you still got to primarily follow the, the history. So what other examples? Well, you know, you, you pick up a book and you see a scantily clad woman on it and some big, tall, dark, handsome guy. 
What kind of fiction is that? Romance. Romance. Okay. Harlequin novels. You know, they're usually about 120 to 150 pages. They can be read in an hour. Okay. Um, and you buy them by the dozen. I mean, if you join my mother-in-law before we moved up here, I used to be a member of a whole bunch of these clubs. And she would literally get three or four dozen of these books a month, okay, in boxes, okay? What else? An awful lot of fantasy fiction is very formulaic, okay? Um, detective novels. If you've read one John Grisham novel, you've read them all, okay? If you've read one Agatha Christie, you've pretty much read them all. Yeah, characters will change, circumstances will change, but you know what's going to happen. Translate that to film. If you've seen one, or even TV, you can go back to the original, the TV series. If you've seen one Mission Impossible, you've seen them all. There's, there's not going to be any change. If you've seen one um, Die Hard film, you've seen them all. If you've seen one Schwarzenegger action movie, you pretty much know what's going to happen. Okay? The first three Harry Potter novels are all about what? I mean, the first one, Harry has to do what? By the time you get to this, you, you realize this. He has to solve the mystery. What's the mystery? What was it that Hagrid brought from Vault 713, took up to the castle, and that is in danger of being stolen? The sorcerer's tongue. What's the mystery in number two? Is there a chamber of secrets? Once they realize there is, who opened it? Okay. What's the mystery in name number three? It's a Prisoner of Azkaban. Is Sirius Black really everything he's made out to be? No, he's not. Is there a mystery in number four? Is number four about the mystery of the Goblet of Fire? Per se. No, it's not. She completely blows the formula. How? By starting with this first chapter. Because the first chapter in the first three books all begin, number four, Privet Drive. So when you had to wait a couple years to get this book, okay, um, or wait a year to get this book, everybody expected when they opened it to the first page for it to be something about number four, Prison Privet Drive, or at the very least to be set at the Dursley home. And we start. The villagers of Little Hamilton still called it the Riddle House. Okay. Even though it had been many years since the Riddle family had lived there. Well, we've been introduced to the name Riddle when? Tom Riddle. Tom Riddle, Chamber of Secrets. Stood on a hill overlooking the village, some of its windows boarded, tiles missing from its roof, ivy spreading unchecked over its face. Once a fine looking manor, easily the largest and grandest building for miles around. So what does that tell us about the people who used to own the Riddle House? They were wealthy, they were, they were well off. Okay? This is a typical, what's called an English manor house. You go back to the Middle Ages, the manor house was the largest house of the village because it was where people would go to for protection if the village was attacked, okay? if there wasn't a castle nearby. The manor house usually had a wall around it, not just around the house itself, but a large area where cattle or livestock could be brought in, usually not cattle, but you know, pigs and sheep and such, and where people could be protected. The little Hangletons all agreed that the old house was creepy. Why? Half a century ago, meaning 50 years ago, something strange and horrible had happened there. 
something that the older inhabitants of the village don't like. Okay, so book one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're told half a century ago, that's 50 years ago. Okay, this was 50 years ago. And when did this one occur? 1942. Two years have gone by, so this is now 1944. All right? Um, that is, the 50 years ago was then. So when this says half a century ago, something strange happened, that means in 1944. This time period, in 1942, Tom Riddle was what? He's a fifth year, right? Sixth year? Seventh year. So, Tom Marvolo Riddle, seventh year, what? And beyond. Okay. Something strange and horrible had happened there. Something that the older inhabitants of the village still like to discuss. And what had happened. The maid came running down the street, screaming as loud as she could. Lying there with their eyes wide open, cold as ice, still in their dinner days. Police were summoned. The whole little Angleton had seized with shock curiosity. Elderly Mr. and Mrs. Riddle had been rich, snobbish, and rude. And their grown-up son, Tom, had been, if anything, worse. All the villagers cared about was the identity of their murderer. For plainly, three apparently healthy people did not all drop dead of natural causes on the same night. The hangman, the village pub, did a roaring trade that night. The whole village seemed to have turned out to discuss the murders. Okay. A man named Frank Bryce had been arrested. Frank was the Riddle's gardener, skipping a bit. He lived alone in a rundown cottage on the grounds of the Riddle House. He'd come back from the war with a very stiff leg and a great dislike of crowds and loud noises. Well, why would he not like loud noises? Because he'd been in the war. And notice, he came back injured. Today we'd call him what? A war hero. Okay. And people say, always oh, thought he was odd, unfriendly like. So they start to talk, why was Frank arrested? Who else had a key to the back door? Blah, 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 blah. Landlord of the pub says the war turned him funny, if you ask me. What's he mean? Oh, crazy. Yeah, today we'd call it PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. After First World War, which my grandfather fought in, it was called shell shock. In other words, he came back a little touched in the mind. Not quite the same as when he went off to war. And Dot says, horrible temper. Okay? But what happens? Is Tom Riddle sent off to prison for the murder? Uh, Tom, Frank Bryce sent off to murder? Sent off to prison for the murder of the Riddles? I'll get the sentence right one of these days. No, because there's no proof. In fact, there's no proof that they were murdered. So they get buried in the churchyard. Frank Bryce returns to his cottage on the grounds and stays there. He tended the garden for the next family that lived there and then the next. Now there's no family that lives there, but Frank Bryce still lives in the gardener's cottage. The guy who now owns the house owns it simply for tax reasons. Okay. And we're told, page five, it was Frank's bad leg that woke him, painting him worse than ever in his old age. Got up, limped downstairs into the kitchen with the idea of refilling his hot water bottle. And he sees a light up at the house. And he figures some kids had started a fire in the room or in the building. So, gets his walking stick. And we're told he goes to the back door. Because the front door of the Riddle House bore no sign of being forced, nor did any of the windows. Frank limped around to the back of the house until he reached a door almost completely 
hidden by ivy, took out the old key, put it into the lock, and opened the door noiselessly. Would a door almost completely hidden by ivy open noiselessly? Or would it go? Because we're not told that Frank's been taking care of the house. I mean, the house is decrepit. What do we see? He let himself into the cavernous kitchen. Frank had not entered it for many years. That seems to imply that Frank hasn't been through that door. All right? So why does the door open noiselessly? Hmm. Just a little detail. So he goes inside and he hears a couple of voices. And the voice belonging to a man says, there's a little more in the bottle, my lord, if you're still hungry. The second voice says, later, but it's a high-pitched voice. Move me closer to the fire, Wormtail. Frank turns his ear to the door because he can't quite make out perfectly what he's hearing. And he hears the cold voice say, where is Nagini? I don't know. She set out to explore. You will milk her before we retire. I will need feeding in the night. The journey has tired me. So, Wormtail asks, how long are we staying? Till after the Quidditch World Cup is over. We find out. Okay. And so there's a little bit more talk. And finally we hear bottom of page 8. Wormtail says, it could be done without Harry Potter, my lord. Without Harry Potter? I do not say this out of concern for the boy. The boy is nothing to me, nothing at all. Shakespeare would say, methinks he doth protest too much. It is merely that if we were to use another witch or wizard, any wizard, the thing could be done so much more quickly. Okay. How many of you have read all of this novel? In the past. Okay, in the past. How many of you have not read this before? Show of hands? Okay, I won't give it away. <clears throat> The thing could be done so much more quickly. If you allowed me to leave you for a short while, you know, I can disguise myself most effectively. I could be back here within two days. I could use another wizard. Hmm. It makes sense. Why? Laying hands on Harry Potter would be so difficult. He is so well protected. Laying hands on Harry Potter. What does Wormtail mean by that? No, not killing. Apprehending. Kidnapping. Harry Potter. Okay. Have you ever heard that phrase, laying hands, used in any other context? Healing. Healing. Okay. Healing. The New Testament talks about laying the laying on of hands. The book of James in the New Testament, for example, says... If you have a member who is ill, gather the bishops together and let them lay hands on that person and pray. It's usually religious language to say laying hands on. He is so well protected. So, you volunteer to go and fetch me a substitute. I wonder, Wormtail, could this be... An attempt to desert me? No, no, never. My devotion to your lordship, his lordship kind of finishes the sentence, is nothing more than cowardice. You would not be here if you had anywhere else to go. What did Sirius and Lupin say about um, Wormtail and why he never revealed himself during the previous 12 years? Because he wouldn't until he knew Voldemort was back. Because he knew others were out looking for him. How am I to survive without you? When I need feeding every few hours. Who is to milk Nagini? But you're so much stronger. Liar. I am no stronger. And then he says silence. Why? Because I have my reasons for using the boys. I've already explained to you. And I will use no other. 
I've waited 13 years. A few more months will make no difference. He said, don't worry about the protection surrounding the boy. I believe my plan will be effective. I don't think Wormtail is thinking the same protection that Voldemort is talking about here. Okay. Voldemort here, I think, is talking about the protection that Harry and Dumbledore discuss at the end of book one. About when Harry's mother died for Harry, she left a protection around him. Okay. They keep talking. Voldemort mentions a faithful servant. And Wormtail says, I am a faithful servant. Voldemort says, I need someone with brains, not you. My other faithful servant. Okay. They keep talking. And Voldemort mentions... After one more murder, page 12, my faithful servant at Hogwarts, Harry Potter, is as good as mine. Frank hears a noise behind him. Frank realizes this man can talk to snakes, page 13. And then Voldemort says on 13, there's an old muggle standing right outside the room. Why don't you invite him in? Right. So Wormtail beckons Frank into the room. Voldemort's chair is turned so that its back is to Frank Bryce and what's in the chair is facing the fire. And he hears from the back of the chair, you heard everything, muggle? Let's say you're calling me. I'm calling you a muggle. It means you are not a wizard. Frank's like, what the? I don't know what you mean by wizard. All I know is I've heard enough to interest the police tonight. I have. You've done murder, and you're planning more. And I'll tell you this, too. My wife knows I'm up here if I don't come back. You have no wife. Nobody knows you're here. You told nobody that you were coming. Do not lie to Lord Voldemort, my girl, for he knows. He always knows. Is that right? Well, Lord, is it? Don't think much of your manners, my Lord. Turn around and face me like a man. But I'm not a man. I am much, much more than a man. But, okay, I'll face you. Wormtail, turn my chair around. Notice, he can't even do that. He can't turn his chair around, and yet he can perform an Avada Kedavra curse. Can't he just kind of go, you know, make the chair turn? The 200 miles away, Harry Potter wakes up with a start. He lies fly on his back, flat on his back, Breathing hard and his scar hurting. And he tries to go over what it was he dreamed about. The old man, the house, the dark picture, Wormtail, and Voldemort. And he thinks about this. Could it have been real? No, it couldn't have been real. Could Voldemort be near and that's why my scar is hurting? So, he thinks he should write to somebody. And he starts to think who he's going to write to. Well, Hermione. Hermione's going to have a bunch of questions, and then she's going to say, Harry thinks, well, let me go look it up in a book. So he thinks, Dumbledore. Okay. Dear Professor Dumbledore, page 21. Sorry to bother you, but my scar scar hurt this morning. You're sincerely Harry Potter. Well, that's stupid. Okay. Then he thinks of Ron. And what Ron would say. And he finally hits on Sirius. He'll know what to do. So he writes a letter off to Sirius, page 24 and 25. Thanks for your last letter. That bird was enormous. Could hardly get through my window. Things are the same as usual here. Dudley's diet isn't going too well. My aunt found him smuggling donuts into his room yesterday. They told him they'd have to cut his pocket money if he keeps doing it. So he got really angry, chucked his PlayStation out of the window. It's a sort of computer thing you can play games on. Stupid, bit stupid, really. Now he isn't, hasn't even got made a Mega Mutilation Part 3 to take his mind off things. I'm okay because the Dursleys are terrified of you. Weird thing happened this morning. My scar hurt. Last time it happened was because Voldemort was at Hogwarts. Don't reckon he can be anywhere near me now, can he? 
Do you know if cursed cars sometimes hurt ears afterwards? Okay, what's the problem with that question? Harry's the only one with this kind of cursed scar. Okay. So Harry thinks, yeah, that's fine. Sends it off. Okay. Next chapter, the invitation. He gets a letter covered with stamps from the Weasleys, which sends Vernon Dursley off into space because it's odd. It's out of the normal. We're told, uh, page 27, middle of the page, about Dudley's diet. Because Dudley had reached roughly the size and weight of a young killer whale. Okay. Um, Vernon shows Harry the letter. Harry opens it. It's Molly Weasley asking if Harry can come to the Quidditch World Cup and such. They agree. Let's see here. Um, Harry gets letters from Ron and the others. Back to the burrow. Mr. Um, Weasley and Fred and George and Ron show up via, via flu powder to take Harry to the burrow. What's the only problem? Fireplace has been boarded up. Fireplace has been closed up. They've remodeled the house and hidden the fireplace. Okay? So, Mr. Weasley does what? Page 44. Bang! The electric fire shot across the room as the boarded up fireplace burst outward, expelling Mr. Weasley, Fred, George, and Ron, and a cloud of rubble and loose chippings. Aunt Petunia shrieked, fell backward over the coffee table. Uncle Vernon caught her before she hit the floor, gaped speechless at the Weasleys, all of them had bright red hair, including Fred and George. Mr. Weasley, oh, that's better. And he goes up and greets Vernon and Petunia. And he turns around and looks at his handiwork, the wall. Sorry about that. It's all my fault, just didn't occur to me. You wouldn't, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, Ron, Fred, and George help Harry get his stuff. And then they go back off to, through the flu powder before Harry does. Okay. Um, pick up on 48. So, Ron, Fred, and George have gone back, not before Fred or George, I forget which one, drops a piece of ton tongue, ton tongue toffee for Dudley to eat. And we just have Harry and um, Arthur left. And Harry says, uh, bye then, starts to walk to the fireplace. They didn't say anything at all. This is page 48. Harry moved toward the fire, but just as he reached the edge of the hearth, Mr. Weasley put out a hand and held him back. He was looking at the Dursleys in amazement. So Harry kind of does this. By then, walks towards the fireplace, and just before he reaches it, Mr. Weasley grabs him, and he's looking back at the Dursleys with a look of astonishment. Harry said goodbye to you. Didn't you hear him? Harry, it doesn't matter. Honestly, I don't care. Mr. Weasley did not remove his hand from Harry's shoulder. Why? What's he doing? He's keeping Harry from leaving. Why? Yeah. Harry's going to stay until they do what? Until they acknowledge him. By saying goodbye. Mr. Weasley uh, did not remove his hand. You're not going to see your nephew till next season. He said to Uncle Vernon in mild indignation, surely you're going to say goodbye. What's that surely mean? Good manners means you will say goodbye. A good person would say goodbye. Uncle Vernon's face worked furiously. 
the idea of being taught consideration. In other words, you should be considerate to Harry. That means it's a fancy word for it. you should be kind to him. By a man who had just blasted away half his living room wall seemed to be causing him intense suffering. You know, Harry's looking at what was left of the wall, and Arthur says, you need to say goodbye to him. It's the appropriate thing to do. It's the considerate thing to do. And Vernon's thinking, it's the considerate thing to do not to blow up half my house. And yet that's what you did. But Mr. Weasley still has his wand in his hand. And Vernon doesn't like those things. Goodbye then. See you, says Harry. And he's off into the flames. At that moment, Petunia starts to scream because Arthur hears a gagging sound and he sees Dudley and he's gagging and sputtering on a foot-long purple slimy thing protruding from his mouth, his tongue. Okay. By the time Mr. Weasley finally gets it all put to right, the tongue is four feet long, if I remember correctly. Okay. So... He fixes it, he fixes the wall, they go off. Okay. Mr. Weasley tells them, he doesn't think that was very funny, though he does laugh for a moment. Um, let's see, pick up with... Harry sees Percy, 56, 57, and such. And Percy's going on and on and on about his new boss at the Ministry of Magic. Mr. Crouch, okay? Um, let's see what we'll pick up. They talk about Ludo Bagman. Let's pick up with a Porky. Mr. Weasley tells about the difficulties for preparing for the World Cup, since it's in England. Um, and he tells the younger children, um, Ginny and Ron, that they've got to travel by port key since, um, well, and Fred and George too, since the others can operate and such. So they go to use the port key, and they meet up on page 72. They meet up with the diggeries. Amos Diggory is a colleague of Mr. Weasley's at the Ministry of Magic. Okay. And um, Arthur Weasley introduces Amos, page 72, to Hermione, friend of Ron's, and Harry, another friend. Mer and Amos says, Merlin's Peter. Harry Potter? Uh, yeah, says Harry. And Amos says... Sid's talked about you, of course. Told us all about playing against you last year. I said to him, Sid, and that'll be something to tell your grandparents, your grandchildren that will. You beat Harry Potter. And notice what Cedric does. This is what shows the essential quality of somebody in Hufflepuff. Okay? Harry fell off his room, Dad. I told you. It was an accident. Yeah, but you didn't fall off, did you, boy? You know, it's almost what Amos says. Always modest, Dark said. Always the gentleman, but the best man won. Notice Cedric says, or let me put the, let me put it this way. Cedric implies what about why he beat Harry? It was only because it was only because Harry fell off his broom. What does Amos Diggory take that to mean? Modest. Well, when he says, are always modest our said, what's he really mean? He's just trying to be nice. Like he really beat him, but he's yeah. trying to. Yeah, but you're the better flyer, son. You didn't fall off your broom. I mean, what kind of moron falls off his broom like Quidditch? That's what Amos Diggory is implying. But. Cedric's modest. I'm not talking about modesty as being the quintessential mark of a Hufflepuff. 
It's Cedric's sense of justice, of justness, of rightness. When he says, Harry fell off his broom bed, I, I told you, it was an accident. Okay? Cedric's not taking glory and having beat Harry. Why? Because he knows it wasn't fair. If it had been a fair Quidditch match, Cedric seems to be implying who would have won. Harry. Because everybody knows. Everybody acknowledges. Harry's the best flyer. Okay? One falls off his broom, one stays on. You don't need to be a genius to tell which one's the better flyer. Okay? Cedric didn't have a hundred dormin dormitors. A hundred dementors tormenting him like Harry did. Okay? So they take the port key, go off to Quidditch World Cup. They meet the Roberts family, whose property the Quidditch World Cup is at. Uh, I'm going to skip a bunch. Page 81. They're walking around through the camp. And this is Harry's first experience, we're told, of, of seeing this kind of environment, of seeing little witches and wizards, one, two, three, five years old. A tiny boy no older than two is crouched outside a large pyramid-shaped tent, holding a wand, poking happily at a slug in the grass, which was swelling slowly to the size of a salami. Then the mother comes out, how many times, Kevin? Don't touch daddy's wand. Notice what the kid is doing with his father's wand. He's apparently using an engorgement charm, making this slug get real big. Okay. Does he even know the words? Short way farther on, they meet a couple of little witches riding toy broomstick, broomsticks. That, you know, just a couple feet off the grass. They keep going on. We um, see a variety of people. Here he sees Cho Chang, page 84. She waves at him and he spills water down himself. Um, skip a bunch. Let's pick up with Pick up with the actual Critical Cup, chapter 8. They go up to their seats, box seats, pages 96, 97. Um, and Harry sees an elf that he thinks is Dobby. Creature sitting at the end of the row behind them. Harry says, Dobby? Did you just call me Dobby? Says the elf. And Harry somehow knows this elf is female. Harry says, sorry, I thought you were someone I knew. But all I know is Dobby too, sir. My name is Winky, sir, and you, sir, you, you're surely Harry Potter. Harry says, yes. But Dobby talks of you all the time, sir. Harry, how is he? How's freedom suiting him? Oh, sir. Meaning no disrespect, sir, but I was not sure you did Dobby a favor, sir, when you were setting him free. Why? What's wrong with him? Freedom's going to Dobby's head, sir. A die idea is above his station, sir. Can't get another position. Harry, why not? Because he's wanting pay for his work. Harry, so? House house is not paid, sir. No, no, no. I says to Dobby, I says, go find yourself a nice family. Settle down, Dobby. What's Dobby's problem? He's been, he's been freed. He's been freed. He's not a slave anymore. Winky says, go find yourself a nice family. And do what? Enslave yourself to it? Right? House house is not supposed to have fun, Harry Potter. House elves does what they're told. I was not liking heights at all, Harry Potter, but my master sends me to the top box and I comes. So, Dobby doesn't like heights, but his master sent him all the way, or her master sent him all the way to the top. She does what she's told. Okay. Um, 
skip a couple pages, page 100, and we see the, we, uh, the um, Malfoys arrive. Harry, Ron, and Hermione turn quickly, edging along the second road. A three still empty seat, right behind Mr. Weasley, were none other than Dobby, the house elf's former owners, Lucius Malfoy, his son Draco, and a woman Harry supposed must be Draco's mother. Okay. She has a look on her face, we're told, that suggests that there's a nasty smell under her nose. So she's walking around kind of like with her face all scratched up. Fudge. Malfoy says, oh, Fudge, how are you? Don't think you've met my wife, Narcissa. Okay. Fudge introduces them to the Bulgarian Minister of Magic. And it says, you know, Arthur Weasley, I dare say. Good Lord, Arthur, says Malfoy. What did you have to sell to get seats in the top box? Surely your house wouldn't have fetched this much. And then notice what Fudge says about Malfoy. Lucius has just given a very generous contribution to St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries. He's here as my guest. What does that tell us? One, about Fudge, and two, about Malfoy. Did Malfoy give the large donation out of the kindness and generosity of its heart? No. No? Okay. What's it then tell us about Fudge? Why did he accept it? Well, it's good for the hospital, okay? What else? What is Malfoy buying? Think Bernie Sanders. Power, influence, okay? Reason I said think Bernie Sanders is what is Bernie, one of Bernie Sanders' big things. Get the money out of politics, okay? Fudge is a politician. He's essentially president, okay, of the Ministry of Magic and of the Muggle, uh, of the Wizarding World, okay, or at least of the British Wizarding World. Mr. Malfoy's eyes had returned to Hermione, who went slightly pink, but stared determinedly back at him. Notice she doesn't give in. Harry knew exactly what was making Mr. Malfoy's lip curl like that. He can't stand mudbloods, muggleborns. Ron, who I think sums up the Malfoys nicely. Slimy gets. Okay. So we see the Quidditch World Cup, which I'm going to skip. Okay. We find out um, Crumb can fly wonderfully, but the Bulgarian team loses. We get Chapter 9, the Dark Mark. Um, page 119. They've gone off to their tent. They've gone to bed, essentially. And Harry imagines himself playing the Quidditch World Cup. He hears Ludo Bagman's voice. Page 118. I give you Potter. And he hears Mr. Weasley, get up, get up. Okay. He tells him, grab your coats, go outside. Page 119. They see people running into the woods, fleeing something that was moving across the field toward them, something that was emitting odd flashes of light and noises like gunfire, loud jeering, roars of laughter, drunken yells were drifting toward them. In other words, it's like the end of a British football game, soccer game. Okay. Crowd of wizards, tightly packed, moving together with lawns pointing straight upward, was marching slowly across the field. Here he squinted at them. They didn't seem to have faces. Then he realized their heads were hooded and their faces masked. Who do they look like? KKK. KKK. I mean, they're wearing white hoods. Right? High above them, floating along in midair, four struggling figures were being contorted into grotesque shapes. It was as though the masked wizards on the ground were puppeteers, and the people above them were marionettes operated by invisible strings. Two of the figures were very small. More wizards are joining the marching group, laughing at 
pointing up. So as this group goes across the field, it gets larger and larger. People are joining it. Once or twice, Harry sees the marchers blow a tent out of their way. What might have been in the tent? The floating people were suddenly illuminated as they passed over a burning tent. Harry recognized one of them, Mr. Roberts, campsite manager. The other three, his wife and children. One of the marchers below flipped Mrs. Roberts upside down with his wand. So Mrs. Roberts has been vertical like this, but up in the air, and somebody whoosh, turns her over. Her nightdress fell down to reveal voluminous drawers, her underwear, and she struggled to cover herself up as the crowd below screeched and hooted with glee. Now this is kind of an interesting little point because we're going to see somebody do this to somebody else in book six. In book six, it's going to, or should, create much more sympathy for the person it's being done to than for the person doing it. Ron, that's sick. That's really sick. So what does this tell us about the mass of people doing this to the Roberts family? First of all, what are they doing? Is this torture? It's not torture. Why is it not torture? I mean, according to one of the strict definitions of torture, it's not painful. Okay, it's not painful. They did say they were contorting them. Like yeah, I mean, it's making them do this. Another reason it's not torture is, again, strict definition. Torture leaves permanent physical scars. Like you cut somebody's finger off. You stick, you know, stuff that happened in Korean War, Second, uh, Vietnam War. You stick bamboo shoots up somebody's fingernails. Okay. Or needles. Yeah, it does leave scars. You break somebody's knees. I mean, look at John McCain. He can raise his arms this high. Why? Because of the torture that he suffered in Hanoi in Vietnam. Okay? First of all, because he broke both shoulders when his plane crashed, and because he never got proper medical care, but then also because he was tortured. Okay? This isn't torture. Is it humiliating? Yes. Is it painful? Possibly. Okay. But what are the people doing it, doing it for? That is, why are these witches and wizards doing this to the Robins? For fun. And attention. And skipping a real obvious one. Okay, it is an act of terror. They can't. They can. Can the Roberts stop them? Nope. Okay. Is anybody else at this point stopping them? No. In fact, what's happening to their numbers is getting larger and larger and larger. Look what happens anytime, you know, throughout the United States, anytime we have a series of riots or something. What's it take to really get a riot going? One person. Because as soon as the second person joins in, it takes three, four. Because you might see a bunch of people rioting, and there will be a bunch of onlookers, right? What happens if nobody stops the actual rioting? If onlookers become... Participants. Right? Mr. Weasley yells to Harry, Ron, Hermione, Jenny, we're going to go help the ministry. So Harry, Ron, Hermione go off to the forest and Ron trips, page 121. And says, tripped over a tree root. 
Well, with feet that size, hard not to. Let me hear Draco Malfoy leaning against a tree, watching what's going on. Ron swears. Language, Weasley. Had you better be hurrying along now. You wouldn't want her spotted, would you? Talking about Hermione. Hermione, what's that supposed to mean? Granger, they're after muggles. Do you want to be shown? Do you want to be showing off your knickers in midair? Because if you do hang around, they're moving this way. It would give us all a laugh. Harry, Hermione's a witch. Have it your own way, Potter. But if you think they can't spout a mudblood, stay where you are. Ron again. I mean, Hermione says, don't worry about it. Okay? They hear a bang from another side of the trees. Several people nearby scream, Malfoy, scare you easily, don't they? Suppose your daddy told you all to hide. What's he up to, trying to rescue the muggles? Harry, where are your parents? Out there wearing masks, are they? Well, if they were, I wouldn't be likely to tell you, would I, Potter? He just acts, I mean, <laughs> by saying that. Okay. So they go off um, into the forest. I'm skipping a bunch. And they see Winky. Um, page 128. They go into the little clearing. And Harry says, hello? There's silence. Harry gets to his feet and he says, who's there? Because he's heard something. As though someone was staggering around toward their clearing. That is, like he hears branches that have fallen on the ground are being stomped on. Who's there? And then without warning, the silence was rent by a voice unlike any they had heard in the wood, and it uttered not a panic shout, but what sounded like a spell, Mors Mordre. And they see a vast green light, and they look up, and there's a skull in the sky. Who's there? Harry says again, because he hears that stomping around noise again. Hermione says, Harry, come on, move. What's the matter? It's the dark mark, Harry. You know who's that? Voldemort, come on. And there's now 20 wizards surrounding them. And Harry immediately realizes one thing. Each of the wizards had his wand out, and every wand was pointing right at himself, right on Hermione. And without pausing to think, he yells, duck. And he grabs the other two and pulls them to the ground, while the other wand, other wizards... Yell, stupefy. Okay. He hears a voice. Stop, Arthur Weasley. A cold, curt voice. Curt means short. It's clipped. Out of the way, Arthur. It's Barty Crouch, who Percy works for. Which of you did it? Which of you conjured the dark mark? Harry, we didn't do that. We didn't do anything, says Ron. Why'd you attack us? Do not lie, sir, says Crouch. And a voice says, uh, Barty, they're kids. What's he mean? They've never been able to. So in order to conjure the dark mark, you've got to be really powerful. Where did the dark mark come from, says Mr. Weasley. Hermione points over there. Okay. There was someone behind the trees. They shouted words, an incantation. Okay. So, Mr. Crouch goes over there and checks. And then they listen to Mr. Diggory. And Mr. Diggory finds a house elf. Page 131 at the bottom. Mr. Crouch did not move or speak as Mr. Diggory deposited his elf on the ground at his feet. The other ministry wizards were all staring at Mr. Crouch. This cannot be. No. No point, Mr. Crouch. There's no one else there. That is, that's a bit, a bit embarrassing, says Mr. Diggory, looking down at Winky's unconscious self. Barty Crouch's house self, I mean to say. 
We don't know much about Barty Crouch at this point, right? Mr. Weasley, come off it, Amos. This is as Barty Crouch goes back off to look in the woods. Yeah, but she had a wand. What? He holds up Winky's wand. Okay. Bagman asks Barty where he's been to. Barty says he's been busy. Notice Barty wasn't at the match. Okay. Page 133, Barty Crouch takes the wand that Winky had, does the innervate charm, and we see the little dark mark come out of it. So we know the wand was used for that. Okay. Diggy, uh, Winky swears, page 134, that she doesn't know how to do that. And Harry looks at it and says, that's mine. It's my wand. I dropped it. You dropped it? Is this a confession? Says Amos Diggory. You threw it aside after you conjured the mark? Mr. Weasel is kind of Diggory. Dick, who are you talking to? Do you really think he's going to be conjuring the dark mark? Oh, bro. What's this tell us about Amos Diggory? No. Because he's really surprised when he meets Harry. He's really quick to point fingers. <clears throat> quick to point fingers, jumps to conclusions. What else? Might he be trying to impress Barney Crouch? To kind of get a, a leg up, as it were? Harry, I didn't drop it there anyway. I missed it right after we got into the wood. So, Diggory says to Winky, you found this wand? Oh, he's not doing magic with it, so I was, I was, I was just picking it up, so I was not making the dark mark. I was not knowing how. Hermione says it wasn't her. It wasn't her voice. And Harry says, nope, definitely didn't sound like an elf. Ron, it was a human voice. Okay. So they do prior incantato. Dark mark comes out. And Diggory says, you've been caught red-handed, Elf. Caught with the guilty wand in your hand. Um, Mr. Weasley says, again, yeah, think about it. Whose Elf is this? And Mr. Crouch says, perhaps Amos is suggesting that I routinely teach my servants to conjure the dark mark. And then Amos kind of, no, not at all. You have now come very close to accusing the two people in this clearing who are least likely. We still don't know a lot about Barty Crouch to conjure that mark. We do know a little bit, though. Okay. But he starts to elucidate. I trust you remember the many proofs I've given over a long career that I despise and detest the dark arts and those who practice them? I, 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 I. So what does Barty do? He gives Winky clothes. He can't be associated with Winky. So he dismisses Winky. So they go back to the tent. And Bill asks 140, did you get the did you get them dead? Did you get the person who conjured the mark? No. Okay. And Hermione comes up to defend Winky again. Page 141. Ron says, can someone explain what that skull thing was, the dark mark? Okay. Hermione explains it, and Mr. Weasley says, and it hasn't been seen for 13 years. In other words, the last time it was seen was when Voldemort was in power. It was almost like seeing you know who back again. Ron, I don't get it. I mean, it's a shape in the sky. Page 142. Mr. Weasley starts to explain. Ron, you know who and his followers sent the dark mark into the air whenever they killed. So it's either a sign or a warning. It's either a sign someone is dead, like, you know, in the, when the faces appear on the screen in the Hunger Games, or someone's about to die. The terror inspired, you have no idea. You're too young. We're going to hear that idea several times in this novel. You can't understand. You're too young. 
And at one point, Ron's finally going to say, you know, try us. Let us determine whether or not we're too young. Just picture coming home and finding the dark mark hovering over your house, knowing what you're about to find inside, everyone's worst fear. Okay. So they mentioned the Death Eaters, the people who were tormenting the Robertsons. Harry, Death Eaters? What are Death Eaters? It's what you know who supporters called themselves. Excuse me, said Bill. I think we saw what's left of them tonight. The ones who managed, the ones who managed to keep themselves out of Eskimo. Mr. Weasley said we can't prove it was them, Bill. Well, it probably was. If it wasn't Death Eaters, then it was a bunch of sickos. Okay, Harry, but what were Voldemort's supporters? Sorry, you know who's. Why were they levitating muggles? I mean, what's the point? What does that question tell us about Harry? What were you know who's supporters up to levitating muggles? I mean, what's the point? In other words, what good was there in it? Why did they do it? What was their purpose for doing it? What does that show us Harry is incapable of thinking of? Racism or like the equivalent. Okay. Take it one step farther. You started to say something? I uh, just said like harming people when they have to go. Harming people for what uh, purpose? Pleasure. For fun. Okay. Treating somebody badly simply for fun, for pleasure. Mr. Weasley, the point? Harry, it's their idea of fun. Half the muggle killings back when you know who was in power were done for fun. Okay? Here's an example, a modern example, a real world example. Something that went on in the United States, um, I don't think it was this past summer. I think it was the summer before that. And we haven't seen as much of it since then. I don't know that it's even still going on. But in various cities around, this, around the country, you know, you'd be walking along on a sidewalk by yourself, usually in a big city. And somebody would, with a group of people with them, somebody would come up beside you or behind you and just deliver you a sucker punch. It was called the knockout game. Can you knock somebody out with a single punch? Okay. And if I remember right, there are like, I think, somewhere between 20 and 40 instances of this happening around the country. I think about five or ten people died from it because they got punched and then they hit it on concrete and died from the head hitting the concrete. Okay. And a few of the assailants were caught. A couple of them were killed because they went up and tried to sucker some punch somebody who was carrying and shot them. Okay. But those who were caught said, hey, man, it's fun. Ain't got nothing else to do. Okay. I suppose they had a few drinks tonight. Couldn't resist reminding us all that lots of them are still at large. In other words, there's a lot of death eaters around, but individually and without getting together, they're not that dangerous. Nice little reunion for them. Mark, but if they were the Death Eaters, why'd they disapparate when they saw the dark mark? Oh, wouldn't they have been pleased to see it? Bill, come on, Ron, use your brains. If they really were Death Eaters, they worked hard to stay out of Azkaban when you know who lost power and told all sorts of lies about him forcing them to kill and torture people. I bet they'd be even more frightened than the rest of us to see him come back. They denied they'd ever been involved with him when he lost his powers and went back to their daily lives. I don't think he'd be too pleased with them. Do you? Hermione, 
So whoever did it was doing it to show support for the Death Eaters or to scare them away? Mr. Weasley, we don't know. But I'd be very surprised if the person who did it hadn't been a Death Eater once. Okay? So, next chapter, Mayhem at the Ministry. Well, what do we... Here, pages 146, 47. They're reading the Daily Prophet. And they're reading something written by Rita Skeeter. Scenes of Terror at the Quidditch World Cup. And Mr. Weasley reads, page 147. I knew it. Ministry blunders. Culprits not apprehended. Lack security. Dark wizards running unchecked. National disgrace. Who wrote this? And he keeps reading, Mr. Weasley. If the terrified wizards and witches who waited breathlessly for news at the edge of the wood expected reassurance from the Ministry of Magic, they were sadly disappointed. A Ministry official emerged sometime after the disappearance, after the appearance of the Dark Mark, alleging nobody had been hurt but refusing to give any more information. Whether the statement will be enough to quash the rumors that several bodies were removed from the woods an hour later remains to be seen. Notice what she has just done. Whether this statement will quash the rumors that several bodies were removed from the woods hours later will remain to be seen. Did we hear about any such rumors at the Quidditch World Cup? No. What has she done? She's created those rumors. Okay. It becomes pretty clear from... This novel and the next one, and to a little extent, number six. J.K. Rowling has little trust for the media because of how she presents journalism. It's, it's sensational, and it's often yellow journalism. Look up the term, okay? Where you have journalists creating news, not reporting it, okay? Um, Percy and Mr. Weasley have got to go off to the Ministry of Magic to help put out fires and such. I'm gonna skip a bunch. Um, page 151. We get a description of the Weasley clock. Kind of an interesting little detail. It had nine golden hands. Each of them was engraved with one of the Weasley family's names. No numerals around the face, but descriptions of where each family member might be. Home, school, work, but also traveling, lost, hospital, prison, mortal peril. Eight of the hands are currently pointing to the home position, but Mr. Weasley's, which was the longest, was still pointing to work. Notice, mortal peril. Mrs. Weasley says, your father hasn't had to go into office on a weekend since the days of you know who. Now, what is that telling us? Those days are back. Okay. They're working him far too hard. Percy, well, father feels he's got to make up for his mistake at the match, doesn't he? If truth be told, he was a tad unwise to make a public statement without clearing it with his head of department. What does that tell us about Percy? He just sucks as a person. Say that again? He just sucks as a person. He sucks as a person. Okay. What else? He's a follower. He's a follower, okay? He used Taylor's language. He sucks up to those in authority and power above him. And you shouldn't do anything until you've been given permission by those in authority or power above you, okay? Notice what Mrs. Weasley does. Don't you dare blame your father for what that wretched Skeeter woman wrote. If Dad hadn't said anything, old Rita would have just said it was disgraceful that nobody from the, from the ministry had commented. 
said Bill. Is Bill defending his father? Yes, he is. Because notice what he says. <coughs> if he hadn't said anything, she would have still attacked the ministry. <coughs> notice, could Arthur Weasley have said anything about the rumor that bodies were pulled out later? No. Why couldn't he? Because there was no such rumor at the time. That rumor occurs or exists solely in Rita Skeeter's mind. Because she creates it. Why does she create that rumor? To get attention. To do what? To... What sells newspapers? Yeah. What sells Fox News, MSNBC, CNN? I can show, like, things that give people yeah, headlines. Okay? It increases circulation. It increases sales. You know, on TV and stuff, it increases ad rates. Do you think the Democrats, I'm completely off topic, do you think the Democrats, if they could have, would have wanted to have had Donald Trump on the stage Tuesday night for the debate? Think about this for a reason. Okay? They had, I read the other day, I didn't watch the debate, I'm not a Democrat. They had what's called 11.2 market share. About 11.2 million households tuned in to watch the debate, the Democrat debate. The Republicans, the first one, had a 25, over 25 million. The second Republican day, debate had over 24 million. Okay, whichever way you do the math, that's twice as many. One of the reasons everybody has acknowledged, even the other Republicans on the debate stage, was because of Donald Trump. If Donald Trump had been at that debate, there probably would have been 20 million people watching. And what would that have meant? Nine million more people would have heard what Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, Jim Webb, Lincoln Chafee, and the other one I'm not remembering. O'Malley. Yeah, Martin O'Malley had to say. 11 more people, 9 million more people would have heard them than did hear them, okay? It's all about numbers, okay? Um, Bill goes on. Rita Skeeter never makes anyone look good. Remember, she interviewed all the Green Gods charm breakers once. <laughs> What's Bill's job? He breaks charms for Green Gods in Egypt. So I'm going to skip a bit again. Arthur comes home. He talks about how hard work is. And we get, um, let's see here. Aboard the Hogwarts Express, we hear pages 159 and following. Mr. Diggory and Arthur talking about Mad-Eye Moody. Page 161, Mrs. Weasley says, your father thinks highly of Moody. Fred, yeah, well, dad collects plugs, doesn't he? In other words, dad's a weirdo. Birds of a feather, Bill, Moody was a great wizard in his time. Old friend of Dumbledore's, isn't he, says Charlie. Fred, Dumbledore's not what you'd call normal either. In other words, you're not giving such great character witnesses. Harry, who is he? He's heard the name, used to work at the ministry. He was an Auror, term we haven't heard before. One of the best, dark wizard catcher. Half the cells in Azkaban are full because of him. He made himself loads of enemies, though. Families of people he caught, mainly. I heard he's been getting really paranoid in his old days. Doesn't trust anyone anymore. Sees dark wizards everywhere. Right? Maybe because in his line of work, he saw dark wizards everywhere. You know, it's like the old adage says, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean somebody's not after you. Okay? Um, they get on the Hogwarts Express, and Charlie says something about, I might be seeing you guys sooner than the end of the year. Okay? 
alludes to some things. Page 165, Harry overhears Malfoy. Harry and Ron overhear Malfoy talking to some friends. Father actually considered sending me to Durmstrang rather than Hogwarts, you know. He knows the headmaster, you see. Well, you know his opinion of Dumbledore. The man's such a mudblood lover. And Durmstrang doesn't admit that sort of riffraff. But Mother didn't like the idea of me going to school so far away. Father says Durmstrang takes a far more sensible line than Hogwarts about the dark arts. Durmstrang students actually learn them. It's the first time we've heard about another school. This one's called Durmstrang. Harry, Durmstrang's another wizarding school? Hermione, yes. Right. Yeah, Hermione mentions the other school. Bulbatal. Okay. Durmstrang comes from a German phrase, Sturm und Drum, which means storm and stress. It's kind of an element of 19th century, 19th century romantic and gothic literature, where you have a setting that involves lots of storms. You know, it was a dark and stormy night, etc. Right? It can also refer to emotional storms. Okay? Lots of distress. Bulbacom means beautiful, literally. Beautiful baton or wands. Okay. So, Father wants to send Malfoy off here. Notice where they actually learn the dark arts. They don't just learn defense against the dark arts. So why doesn't he go? Keep going, because his mom doesn't want him to go so far away. What's that tell us? He's a little mama's boy. He's a little mama's boy. He is a little mama's boy. And who calls the shots in the family? Mama. Because Lucius didn't get his way. Okay. We'll stop there. <laughs>